Good morning. We welcome you to the Sabbath School time. Last night we were blessed with a fantastic presentation by Dr. Jennings, and uh, that will be available on the website sometime in the next few days for any of those who may want to view it again. Today, Dr. Jennings will be speaking and answering difficult Bible questions during this time period. And we will begin with a word of prayer and turn the mic over to him. Father, we ask your blessing today. We thank you for the beauty of the life of Christ as revealed in your word. May your spirit bless us today as we listen, think, and grow. We thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. So this morning, we're going to do our first talk on answering difficult Bible questions. And these are questions. So we're going to, the questions that I've picked up over time where people have struggled to understand the, the view of God as designer, creator, and his laws, laws upon which reality are designed to operate. And, and they will often come back with these questions frequently uh, to try and argue that God is uh, functionally no different than a Roman Caesar, makes up rules and enforces and punishes for disobedience. And so these are the questions we're going to, going to answer today and show that, in fact, the, the better answers are always seeing God as the creator and his laws are the laws upon which reality are built to operate. So before we get into the specific questions, I want to give you two evidence-based boundaries or constants upon which we can use to, to frame our answers. First is the law of love. Now, when I say the law of love, I'm not talking simply emotion and compassion. I'm talking about the design protocol of love. God is love, and when he created his universe, he built it to operate on the protocols of love, beneficence, or giving. Simple example, every breath you take, you give away carbon dioxide to the plants, and the plants give oxygen back to you, a never-ending circle of giving upon which life is built. But you are still free to transgress the law. You can tie a plastic bag over your head, hold the, hoard your carbon dioxide, but the wages of that is death. And many, many, many more examples that I could give, but we're not going to go into today. But the point being is when you understand the law of love as a design protocol, any doctrine that deviates from that design we have misunderstood. God is not contrary to his own nature of love. The second law I'll spend a little more time on this morning, it's the law of liberty. Now you may not have heard about liberty, the law of liberty in that way before, but think about the law of gravity for a moment. Do you have to believe in the law of gravity for gravity to work in your life? Do you have to know about gravity? If you go to the top of this church and say, I deny gravity, I, I, I refuse to believe it exists, and you step off the building, Will gravity care? No, it still works. It's a constant. The law of liberty is like this. You may not have heard of it. You may deny it, but it's still a constant. Gravity is predictable, and so is the law of liberty. You can predict what will happen if you step off a building. You can predict what will happen if you violate liberty, and there's three predictable consequences. So let me give you the example. A young man has been dating a woman, and he decides this is the one he wants to marry, so he proposes. She has some attraction to him, but she's not sure yet he's the one, so she asks for some time to think about it. He becomes insecure, reaches in his pocket, pulls out a gun, puts it to her head, says, look, I spent time on you, I spent money on you, you better marry me and you better love me, or I will kill you. Now, you, you think this is a little far-fetched? I've used this as an example for, for about 15 years now or more. I just actually got a news article two weeks ago about a guy in Pennsylvania who was arrested because... He murdered the woman who he proposed to when she said no. He broke her neck and actually plucked out her eyes because she refused a marriage proposal. Yes, thank you. All righty. So when he puts the gun to her head and says, if you don't love me, I'm going to kill you, does she respond, finally a strong man who will take care of me? No. First predictable consequence when you violate liberty is love is always damaged and will eventually be destroyed, and a desire to rebel is instilled in the heart. Second consequence, a desire to rebel is instilled in the heart. See, she doesn't want to get closer to this guy. She wants to get away. She doesn't love him more. She loves him less. In any relationship, this is a testable law. If you're in a relationship with somebody and you begin to coerce them, to threaten them, to pressure them, and it doesn't have to be physical coercion. That's one way. It can be emotional coercion. 
If you don't do what I say, I'm going to pout. I'm going to stomp. I'm going to scream. I'm going to break a lamp. I'm going to throw a phone. Uh, I'm going to have a, a hysteria. And you live under the fear of the consequence of what that person will do if you don't do what they want. You will love them less over time. You will want to get out. You'll want to rebel. And there's a third consequence that comes if you choose to stay in that relationship. Over the course of time, your ability to think and reason for yourself is eroded, and you become what I call a shadow person, a person who thinks through the lens of the other person's mind. And instead, when somebody says, hey, would you like to go play golf this weekend? Instead of going, you know, I don't think I have any conflicts in my schedule. Yeah, let's go. You go, oh, what will my spouse say? Will they be mad? Um, will they be angry? Uh, they might not want me to go. Oh, better not. You see, this is a shadow person thinking through the lens of another person's mind. Now, these are testable laws. And by the way, the law of liberty is why the Bible says, not by might nor by power, but by the way the Spirit works, says the Lord. Yep. Not by might nor by power. This is the Spirit of truth. See, can God get your love and trust by threatening to kill you if you don't love and trust Him? Can He do that? Will it work? Love me or I'll kill you. Do you understand that what I just said is the core to the majority of Christian doctrine? God is love. He loved you so much. He didn't want you to die. He sent a son to die for you, to be your Savior. If you don't accept him as your Savior, though, justice will require that God torture and kill you. That's common Christian teaching. And that's based on God's law functioning no different than the types of laws we make up, a rule that he then has to enforce with coercion. Rather than seeing God as creator, the builder of reality, and his laws are the laws upon which life exists, and sin deviates from those laws, unless we are dead and trespass in sin, we have a terminal condition, and God through Christ is working to restore us back to rightness, back to perfection, also known as righteousness, heal and fix what's broken in us, unless God was in the Son, reconciling the world to himself. Nothing needs to be done to God. God is not against us, but if you're terminal and you refuse the remedy, what happens to you? You die, thus the wages of sin is death. Sin, when full grown, brings forth death. Death comes out from sin. Death does not come out from God. This is the big difference. So with these things in mind, spirit is the spirit of truth and love. That's what the point of that is. So, understanding this, Bible commentators have written, this is Desire of Ages, 759, rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His, his authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love. And the presentation of these principles is the means to be used. God's government is moral, and truth and love are the prevailing power. See, think about that. Power, truth and love, power. Power to do what? Power to change hearts and minds. That's the power. See, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish every argument and pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought to Jesus Christ. You cannot win people to love and trust by using might and power to kill them if they don't love and trust. But you can by truth and love. Truth and love. This is a review in Herald, September 7, 1897. God could have destroyed Satan and all his sympathizers as easily as one can pick up a pebble and cast it to the earth. But by doing so, he would have given a precedent to the exercise of force. All the compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. He would not work on this line. This principle is wholly of Satan's creation. Get your mind around that. Because many people in Christianity, including many people in the Adventist church, deny this and teach that justice requires that God use power to punish the wicked. He must inflict punishment. That's Satan's view of God. So how to apply the law of love and the liberty? They are interpretive boundaries. If you read any passage of Scripture and you're tempted to interpret it as violating the law of love or violating the law of liberty, you know your interpretation is wrong because those are constants. They never change. You have to come back and say, wait, I'm misunderstanding something. Our interpretations must harmonize with God's design laws of love and liberty. 
So, first Bible text, cursed is the ground. Do you know the text? Cursed is the ground because of you. It says uh, right after Adam's sin. I get this one from people who like the imposed law concept, believe God is a punisher of sin, and they would say, look, you deny God punished the sin. As soon as Adam eats sin, they threw him out of the garden and he cursed the ground. He's punishing them for their sin. That's how level, that's how people who hold the imposed law construct think. God uses power to inflict punishment for disobedience. However, design law understand that in fact, sin deviates from God's design and how he built life to operate. Nature now, the planet, is out of harmony from God and his design. Nature is separated from the unveiled glory of God, his full life-giving presence. He's veiled himself. An enemy, according to Jesus, is now on earth sowing seeds of decay into the planet. Paul says that all nature groans under the weight of sin. Weeds, thorns, thistles, and death now infect the system. Earth has a principle that leads to death, and death is happening on the planet. This is not how God designed the planet. Something has changed. Thus, it becomes harder to reap a harvest. Everybody with me? So God, in Genesis, is pronouncing, and or if you like this word, diagnosing reality. Because of what you've done, earth is now changed. Because of you, the, the, the ground is cursed. It's going to be harder. God is not using power to inflict it. He's simply accurately diagnosing what is. Why does man rule over woman? This is another one. Well, because woman sinned, God uses power to subordinate her and put man in charge. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. The imposed law, yep, God's using his power to make it happen. It's God's will. And boy, if you, if you think women are equal in this world of sin, then you really are going against the divine will because the divine will, as God said, it should be this way. Those who understand design law, though, know that God is describing what naturally happens when selfishness replaces love in the heart. And what naturally happens when selfishness becomes the rule in a heart? Here's what naturally happens. The strong will dominate the weak. And the weak will long to be protected by the strong. That's what naturally happens. And you can see it in any, you can see it in groups of kids. You can see it in any society. And because selfishness was now in the heart, and men were more physically powerful than women, they were going to dominate their wives. And the wives are going to seek someone to protect them. God was not causing this to happen. God was simply diagnosing or describing what was going to happen now that love was not the primary motive in their heart. This is what's going to happen now. Why did God sometimes, in Old Testament, put people in the grave? Now, there are some people who, who promote the, the beautiful character of God, love picture, who deny that God ever used his power to put people in the grave. They will take examples where God is attributed to having done it, and it's very clear that he didn't do it. Book of Job, fire came down from God, they said, but we know Satan was doing that. Or King Saul, who fell on his own sword, yet it's described in one place that God put him to death. And they would take these examples where sometimes God is ascribed to putting people to death that we clearly know he didn't do, and they will extrapolate that to all places, all times that God never put anybody to death. Well, that's actually not consistent with how reality works. And, I, and I, I always give them this example, they can never answer it. It doesn't fit. And that's the platoons that came to arrest Elijah. If you understand the context, uh, Ahab has led Israel into Baal worship. God has called Elijah to confront Baal worship by calling for no rain. Baal is the god of weather and rain, so if there's no rain, Baal, Baal has no power. Ahab sends troops out to hunt down Elijah and kill him because he's undermining his authority and undermining Baal. And when they finally, and, and of course, who is inspiring Ahab to do this, and who is behind Baal worship? Satan is, right? So do you really think that when um, these troops who are coming to do Satan's purpose of killing Elijah finally arrive and corner him, that when Elijah calls for fire, Satan obliges and kills the troops and saves Elijah? This is what some people would have you believe. It's not consistent. It's not credible. We have to accept that there were times in Scripture where God used his power to put people in the grave. Can we bring...
So how do we handle that? Well, the imposed law people, God is using his power. They're disobedient. They're wicked. They're in rebellion. And God, see, this is proof. God will, God will punish sin. Design law understand a larger reality. After humanity sinned in Eden, could the human race be saved without Jesus Christ? Anybody believe they could be saved without Jesus? No. Did Satan know right then in, in, in Genesis that a Messiah was promised? Genesis chapter 3, God speaks to the serpent and says, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. You're going to bruise his heel. What did Satan do? Did he kick back on a lounge chair and go on vacation? Or did he get busy seeking to stop God's plan? What do you think he would have done? Okay, fine, I'll just go on vacation, wait for it to happen. Or do you think he began working to try to oppose what God was going to do? Now, can you think of a stratagem that if it had worked, would have actually stopped Jesus from coming as a human being? Besides killing every human being. That would have worked. No human's alive, can't come. But besides, besides that one, how about this? Would God have baby Jesus born to a woman with a character like Jezebel? Would he have done that? Would God force a woman against her will to be the mother of Jesus? Would he have done that? That would have been violation of the law of liberty, right? No, he wouldn't have done that. So God needed a righteous woman who would be willing to be the mother of Jesus, right? So what happens if Satan gets every human heart on the earth to harden permanently against God? There's no avenue for Christ to come, is there? Well, you say that's ridiculous. Millions and millions of people, that's not going to happen. Well, according to Scripture, at the time of the flood, how many righteous men were on the earth? One. Get your mind around that. Whole planet, one righteous man. The avenue for Messiah is almost gone. There's only one man still working with God. So God acts. Does he act upon his sin? Or does he act in mercy to keep open avenue for Messiah? Because if he doesn't act, he loses us all. This was an act of punishment. This was an act of therapeutic intervention. He, and how long did God wait? Look at how patient he was. There was not one more human being that he could wait for. Because there's only one left. It's always acts of mercy, never acts of punishment. Throughout the whole Old Testament, you'll find the same theme when you understand the larger reality of what's trying to happen here. God is acting. I don't have this in the, in the slides, but I will just throw it out there. Sodom, Gomorrah, and the five cities. Same process. After the flood... Shortly thereafter, God doesn't say that the seed of the woman from any human family is going to crush your head. He says to Abraham, it's going to be your seed. So now the devil knows he, that the Messiah isn't coming from just any human family, one human family. So he can focus his attention now on this. If he can crush Abraham's seed, his descendants, then he can shut the avenue, right? Well, without Sodom and Gomorrah and the five other cities, the seven cities of corruption, without them on the earth, how many tribes were left by the time Jesus came? Two. Ten tribes have gone. They're evaporated, destroyed, corrupted themselves so bad they've just gone. I think God, looking down the corridors of time, knew that if those other seven cities had remained their influence would have been so corrupting those other two tribes wouldn't have been able to survive either. And so God excised the minimum number of the necrosis that was necessary in order to keep open avenue for Messiah. And you'll find the same thing happening all through Scripture. God is acting to keep open avenue for Messiah. Now after, if you look at the history of human race, after Jesus comes, dies, rises again, and completes his mission, we still have just as much horrible wickedness. Nero's and Pol Pot's and Hitler's and Stalin's. We have just as much horribleness in the world. But you don't find God acting this way anymore. There was no longer a need. Satan could not stop Christ. from completing. He's already done. The mission's achieved. The species human has been saved in Christ. And we'll come to that in our next talk and how he did that. So how do we understand all this? Was God sending people to their eternal torment before judgment or... Was God closing their probation, shortening their opportunity for repentance? Impose law people? His law functions no different than our types of laws? Yes, they broke the law. They would, they would not repent. Uh, justice requires punishment. Therefore, God punished them. 
design law people, well, God is working to heal and save, but how? Well, this requires we understand a little about the nature of humanity. Human beings are tripartite. In other words, we have three parts. The body says we have a body, soul, and a spirit. The Greek for body is the, is the word soma. You might have heard psychosomatic. It's talking about your body. Soma is your body. This would be, if we use a computer metaphor, a computer analogy, this would be analogous to the computer's hardware, the machine. Your physical body is the soma, the hardware. The Greek word for soul is psyche, from where we get psychiatry and psychology. It means your unique individuality, your unique personhood, your identity. This would be analogous to a computer's software. And the Greek word for spirit is panuma, from where we get pneumonia, pneumatic tire, pneumatic pump. It means air or breath or breath of life. When Jesus died, he gave up his spirit. Or, it's also described, he expired. He exhaled. The breath of life left him. This would be analogous to a computer's energy, electricity. Now, think about it. To be operational, think about your computer for a minute. If you have any two of those three, you have hardware, software, no electricity, do you have an operational computer? You have electricity and software, no hardware. Electricity and hardware, no software. You see, two out of those three, you have a non-functioning computer. To be operational, you have to have all three. Same thing with a human being. You have two out of those three, you have a non-operational. You might have a body. God formed a body out of the dirt of the earth. But he was not yet living. Breath of life had not been breathed in. Body doesn't bring life. You have to have all three to have an operational computer. Now, when your computer runs out of power, what state does it go into? I didn't hear you. It sleeps. And how does the Bible describe those who die? They sleep. And this is getting very interesting, isn't it? Okay? Jesus, uh, they sleep. But Jesus said those who believe in him will never die. Didn't he say, if you believe in me, you'll never die? Okay? But does that mean they'll never sleep? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear an amen for that one. You know, many of them sleep. All the apostles are sleeping, right? But they won't die because biblical death is not sleep. When your computer runs out of power, it's not dead. When people run out of power on this earth, they're not dead. They're just sleeping. Now, what happens if your computer's backed up on a cloud? Get your mind around that. And somebody takes, your computer's backed up on a cloud, somebody's got the machine, some evil person's got your computer now, but all your data's backed up on the cloud. And they threaten to destroy your machine. Are you really too worried about it? A little bit worried, but not, not as worried as if they have all your data, right? And so Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can destroy the body, the hardware, but can't destroy the soul, the software. Don't worry about that. So what happens when we die? What we call death, the sleep death. The body, soma, hardware, machine, goes back to dust from where it came, dirt from where it came, disintegrates. The spirit, the panuma, the life energy, returns to God who gave it, according to Scripture. And your soul, your psyche, your individuality, your software is safe and secure with Christ in heaven on the heavenly servers known as the Lamb's Book of Life. waiting to be downloaded into new hardware. The person sleeps, waiting to be downloaded into their... And for the righteous, guess what? We get an upgrade. See, have you ever looked in the mirror and thought like I do sometimes? I'm sure am glad to know this is not as good as the Lord can do. If you haven't thought that yet, just give it a few years. You will think that. So Paul, now notice this description. Now, when I, For those who are Seventh-day Adventists in the room, this is a famous description about the resurrection that you will hear at almost every funeral. But Adventists will kind of mumble over or skip the beginning. 
because most Adventist pastors don't like it and don't know how to handle it. And here's the beginning of the passage. But, but when you understand what I've just taught you, it all fits perfectly. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that, notice, God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. That's the part the Adventist pastors don't like. What do you mean, bring with them? They're not in heaven. They're in the grave sleeping. That's the typical view, right? But no, this passage has God bringing with him from heaven those who have fallen asleep. But keep going. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Wait a second. One passage, we have the righteous dead coming down from heaven, and we have the righteous dead coming up out of the grave. They're coming from two places. Why is that? Because their hardware, new bodies, upgraded physical beings are created out of, the, out of the physical dirt of the earth. But their individualities, their softwares, their identity, their personhood are safe and secure with Christ in heaven in a state of sleep, waiting to be downloaded. And the breath of life, they live again. Perfect harmony. Do you see the beauty of that? Well, this is important to understand so that when you look at the Old Testament times and you see God using his power to put people in the grave, what is he actually doing? In the imposed law construct, he's punishing. He's executing. Design law, he's turning off the power. He's unplugging them. He's putting them in sleep mode. Like shutting off your computer, popping out the battery. You have not destroyed it. You've only suspended it in time. And they will come up out of the grave, and just imagine you pulled the battery and shut your computer off for a hundred years. And a hundred years later, you put the battery in and you turn the computer on. What state does it come back in? The exact state it was when it was turned off. No new data, no new upgrades, no information has, has happened in those hundred years, right? They come back exactly as they were when they went off. He did this to keep open avenue for the Messiah. This is why the, and by the way, this is why the wicked are raised to life again. So the sequence of future events, as I understand them, Christ returns with his heavenly servers, creates new bodies for the righteous, downloads them, their software, their individualities, their souls in bodies, and they breathe the breath of life, and they live again, the resurrection of the righteous. We just read about it in 1 Thessalonians. The righteous living are transformed to meet Christ together with those who have been raised. The wicked on earth are put into sleep mode. And the wicked already in sleep mode are left in sleep mode. At the end of the thousand years, the wicked are raised from sleep mode. Why raise the wicked? What's the purpose of raising them? Because God is love. And every person is given true freedom to determine their own eternal destiny and their race to finish their lives by their own choices. And in so doing, allowing this to happen, allowing them to make their own choices, God reveals that his actions in Old Testament times and putting people in the sleep mode in no way influenced or determined their eternal destiny. They choose their eternal destiny. Watch this. So a thousand years after the righteous are raised, Christ, the saints, and the new Jerusalem, and the holy angels come to earth. The wicked are raised to life with the same characters, same train of thoughts, just like turning your computer back on is when they were put in sleep mode. And a period of time, according to Scripture, goes by now. New Jerusalem's on earth, righteous on earth. A period of time goes by while the wicked prepare implements of war. Did you know that the Bible teaches that? It's not down, boom, shh, immediate. There's a period of time that goes by. They're building, they're organizing. They're getting ready to attack the city. And during that entire time, the new Jerusalem is on earth with Christ and the saints, and the gates are open. The gates of the city are open the entire time. Think of the implications now. Get your mind around what that would look like. What would it mean? Yet not one person amongst the wicked come into the city. Not one come. They're not being kept out by God. Who's keeping them out? 
Now you say, I can't believe that. I can't possibly believe that could be true. With the evidence of the New Jerusalem, with the saints in there, man, you might have a loved one and you're on the walls of New Jerusalem, you're calling out to your loved one that this is the, the Savior, the Messiah, it's perfect, it's, it's wonderful, come on in. Certainly they would listen to your testimony and come on in, wouldn't they? Imagine you had a loved one in the Branch Davidian compound down in Waco a few years back, believing David Koresh was the Messiah. And your loved one was up on the wall and they had a banner with your name on it calling you to come in and worship David Koresh. Are you going in? The answer, seriously, are you going in to do that? Why would you not go in? Your loved one is convinced. You see, everyone outside the city will be just as convinced that as you were that David Koresh is not, is not Christ, they will be just as convinced that Jesus is not the Christ. They're not coming in. All stay out because they are so settled into Satan's lies about God that the truth has no impact on them. All stay out by their own choice, not by God's power to exclude them. Thus, it is demonstrated that God's action in powering people down in the Old Testament in no way determine their destiny. Even with all this evidence in the New Jerusalem, they won't be persuaded. You say, that's really, I can believe that really could be that possible. There's evidence for this. When the mob came to arrest Christ, do you remember what the scene was? First, a little divinity flashed through, and the mob fell down. It was so overwhelming to them, ah, oh, they fell down. And then Peter said, now's my chance. He out his sword. Whew! Wipes off an ear. I don't think he was aiming for the ear. The guy dodged, got an ear. Jesus said, put up your sword. Jesus picks the ear up, puts it right back on. They're all watching. Think, get, get your mind around that. He just, boom, the ear's on, healed. And what do they do? They bind him and take him off and kill him anyway. That evidence had no impact on them. It didn't change them. When you're settled into lies like that, the truth has no impact. So even with all this evidence, they won't be convinced. Each person finishes their own life by their own choices, which is consistent with both the laws of love and liberty. No coercion ever. So how do we understand consuming fire? And once we do the consuming fire piece, then we're going to put it all together in a grand story about how it all comes together in the end. So how do we understand the, the Bible references about eternal burnings and consuming fires that are consistent with Scripture? So we want to be true to the Bible and harmonize with the laws of love and liberty. Well, let's look at Scripture. Isaiah 33, verse 14. The sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling grips the godless. Who of us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who can dwell with the everlasting burning? Guess who gets to spend eternity in the fire? Here's the very next verse, Isaiah 33, verse 15. He who walks righteously and speaks what is right, who rejects gain from extortion, keeps his hand from accepting bribes, who stops his ears against plots of murder and shuts his eyes against contemplating evil. The righteous will be the ones put in the fire, not the wicked. Whoa, when I first read this, it did not compute. I said, this has to be a mistranslation. I went to another version, went to another version, went to another version, went to another version. Guess what? They all say the same. I go, man, there's something wrong with my understanding of these things. So I started in Scripture and started searching every Bible text about consuming fire and eternal burning. That's what I found. When Moses talked to the bush, what's the bush described as doing? When Moses talked to God at the bush, what's the bush described as doing? Burning. Did it get consumed? When God comes down to Sinai, what's the mountain described as doing? Having, quote, a consuming fire. But did the mountain melt down like a nuclear weapon hit it? No, it did not. When Solomon's temple is dedicated, the priest cannot enter the temple that day. Why not? The brightness of God's glorious, fiery presence was too bright, they couldn't enter. Did the temple burn down? No, it did not. Lucifer, is said, prior to his fall, walked among, quote, the fiery stones of God's presence. In Daniel chapter 7, it says, The Ancient of Days takes his seat, and rivers of fire come out from before him, and thousands and thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand are standing in this fire. You getting where I'm going here? It says in Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. 
New Jerusalem, it says, will not need a, a, a sun to light the place because God's presence will be its light. The lie that Satan has perpetrated upon the world is the place you don't want to go and the place you definitely want to run from and not be is the place of eternal burning and consuming fire, and that place is God's very presence. The righteous are transformed like Moses to live in this fire. Remember Moses, after 40 days in God's presence, comes down from the mountain. What's his face doing? He's it's radiating some type of light, fiery energy. Did Moses have third-degree burns? Did his whiskers even catch fire? No, it wasn't harmful. What did the children of Israel do when they saw his face? They asked him to cover it. Why? Because in their sinful consciousness and hearts, the heavenly light was uncomfortable and painful. They couldn't tolerate it. They didn't like it. And that's why it says in Scripture, when Christ comes, the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Get your mind around. This is a very strange fire. Fire that destroys the wicked but heals the righteous. This is, this is a fire that consumes sin. It's a fire that consumes sin. When we think of fire, we think of what we call combustion. The fire that consumes physical matter is sin made out of physical matter. If I chop off a piece of this wood here, do I get a piece of sin? Sin is not made out of physical matter. What is sin made out of? Sin has two primary elements or roots. First root, lies. Satan is the father of lies. And the second root is selfishness, which is the opposite of love. So what is it that will destroy or consume or burn out a lie? The truth. What is it that burns out or consumes selfishness? Love. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and love. And thus at Pentecost, when the Spirit fell, they saw two streams of fire. The fires of truth and the fires of love. Did anyone get burned? Did the building burn down? But did all kinds of dissension and disharmony burn out of their hearts and they were in one accord? Unity, at one mint. Further evidence. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, offer unauthorized fire to the Lord in, in the sanctuary and it says, notice, so fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Moses summons the cousins and says to them, come here, carry your cousins outside the camp. So they came and they carried them still in their tunics outside the camp. Now if I hit you with a flamethrower and burn you till you die, will you still be in your clothes when I'm done? Do you understand? This is not combustion. This is a different type of fire. This is the fire of truth and love. So what happens to those who've solidified their hearts and minds in lies and selfishness when they come into the presence of infinite, unveiled truth and love? What happens to them? Do you think this is a pleasant experience for those people? So I have patients who have been molested as kids, and in the therapy healing process, many times they will say something like, I just wish my uncle would admit what he did. I just wish my stepfather or my grandfather, whoever it was, I just miss, wish they would admit what they did. And I said, take that at face value. If they actually were to admit it, acknowledge it genuinely and for real, wouldn't that mean that they would necessarily go through a period of guilt, shame, self-loathing, self-disgust? Wouldn't they, wouldn't, if they were being honest and really admit it, wouldn't they have to go through that? And if they did that here today, aren't they still under the umbrella of God's grace? And wouldn't God's spirit be striving to heal and restore them, right? To, right? To cleanse them, right? So what will it be like for the wicked at the end of time to come face to face with full awareness of their own sinful selves? And they have full awareness of the pain and the suffering they've caused others. They cannot hide from it anymore. You see, this is going to be terrible weeping and gnashing. Does this suffering come out from God as a punishment upon them? Or is this the unavoidable pain and suffering that unremedied sin causes the sinner? Origen of Alexandra said, Scripture indicates that every sinner kindles for himself the flame of his own fire and is not plunged into a fire which has been previously kindled by someone else 
or which existed before him. Ezekiel, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 28, God speaks, By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuary. Speaking of Lucifer, so I made fire come out from you, and it consumed you. This fire is coming out from the, the, the being themselves, from their own characters. Well, what do we do with Revelation 14? Uh, Adventists know this one. We have to deal with this. We want to be true to the scripture. And the third angel followed them and said with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength in the cup of his wrath. He'll be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. Amen. What do we do with this? How do we understand it in light of all we've talked about? Well, the Greek word translated burning sulfur is the Greek word theon, which is a form of the word theos. Only one letter difference. They're, they have a root connection. The word theos, if somebody studies theos, they are studying about God. They're studying theology or they're a theologian because they're studying about God who is theos. Thus, theon is the fire of God, divine fire, divine incense, or the fire of God's presence. That's exactly what the fire is. And how do we know? Look at the text. We'll go back and look at the text itself. Where is this terrible fire happening? In the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. That's where the fire is. It's the Ancient of Days taking his seed and rivers of fire come out before him. It's the fires of love and truth. Well, what about the smoke of their torment rising forever and ever? Smoke is something that remains after something is burned or consumed. And thus, in biblical imagery, it is symbolic of the memory that the righteous will have of how unremedied sin destroys the sinner. And for all eternity, we will remember forever and ever, what sin has done to God's creation. We will not forget. So putting all this together, and uh, these Bible passages together in story form, I will read you some historical quotations kind of putting together in story form. It says, at last the order to advance is given. This is after the thousand years. The new Jerusalem's on earth. The gates have been opened. Uh, Satan is, uh, and his, uh, the, wicked, the wicked humans have been raised and Satan has been organizing them to build implements of war. That time has passed and now they're organizing to march on the city. At last the order to advance is given and the countless hosts move on. An army such as was never summoned by earth's conquerors, such as the combined forces of all ages since war began on earth could never equal. Satan, the mightiest of warriors, leads the van, and his angels unite their forces for this final struggle. Kings and warriors are in his train, and the multitudes follow in vast companies each under its appointed leader. With military precision, the serried ranks advance over the earth's broken and uneven surface to the city of God. By command of Jesus, the gates of the New Jerusalem are closed. If they're being closed at the time of the assault, what position were they in prior? Right. They had to be open. So this is how this author, if you're looking for the gates are open text, you may not find it. But this author, by describing what's happening, is implying or basically describing that the gates have been opened at this point, and this is the time at which they're being closed. The gates of the, by, by command of Jesus, the gates of the New Jerusalem are closed. The armies of Satan surround the city and make ready for the onset. Now Christ again appears in the view of his enemies. Far above the city, upon a fountain of burnished gold, is a throne, high and lifted up. Upon the throne sits the Son of God, and around him are the subjects of his kingdom. The power and majesty of Christ no language can describe, no pen portray. The glory of the eternal Father is enshrouding a son. The brightness of his presence fills the city of God and flows out beyond the gates. Notice, where is the first place the fire flows? And who lives in the city? The righteous. This is evidence the fire is not harmful. Further evidence for that, by the way? Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is still in a human body that will die very shortly. This body, this human body, is subject to death. And he is filled with this fire such that he's radiating like the sun, according to the scripture, and did it harm him? The fire is not harmful. Sin is harmful. 
So the, the brightness of its presence fills the sea of God, flows out beyond, beyond the gates, flooding the whole earth with its radiance. That was uh, that whole section, Great Controversy 664. As soon as the books of record are open and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin they have ever committed. They see just where their feet diverge from the path of purity and holiness, just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in violation of God's law. The seductive temptations which they encouraged by indulgence in sin, the blessings perverted, the messengers of God despised, the warnings rejected, the waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant heart, all appear as if written in letters of fire. That's two pages later. Just kind of truncating the story. Could those whose hearts are filled with hatred of God of truth and holiness, mingle with the heavenly throng and join their songs of praise? Could they endure the glory of God and the Lamb? No, no. Years of probation were granted them that they might form characters for heaven. But they have never trained the mind to love purity. They have never learned the language of heaven, and now it is too late. A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They would long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction, that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. It's not a verdict by the judge. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary. Did you ever know that? The wicked voluntarily don't want to be there voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Like the waters of the flood, the fires of the great day declare God's verdict. You could say God's diagnosis that the wicked are incurable. This was consistent with Revelation where they beg for the mountains to fall on them and hide them from him who sits on the throne. They don't want to be in his presence. This is all design law. It's a condition of being. It is not a judicial <clears throat> process with inflictions. So why raise the wicked? The death of the wicked, in the end, are voluntary with themselves, just as the scripture said, the mountain, they beg for the mountains to fall, and they don't want to be in a place of purity and love. Why? Because their condition is terminal, and their condition causes unimaginable suffering when exposed to unveiled love and truth. Yet the more... Now, some of you, if you are Adventists, you may have texts or quotations from Ellen White that describe some are many days consuming and as long as so forth and so on, and some are consumed in a very quick time. How do we harmonize that one? Because the more selfish of the being, the more tenaciously they resist truth. And they fight against it in their own psyche, in their own minds. Thus, some linger in the fires of truth and love, denying and resisting longer than others before they finally give up and say, I don't want to live in this universe. And now we have about 10 minutes for some questions. Yes? The salvation is offered by choice. He's saying universal salvation is offered. By choice, so it's not actual salvation. Yes, yeah, so, so yes, I think every, everybody, I, well, everybody but hyper-Calvinists believe that God offers salvation to everyone. God wants all men to be saved. For God's love of the world, he gave his only gift. Yes, so universal salvation is offered to all human beings, but not all choose to partake of that, and many are lost. But they're not lost because God doesn't want them there, or God makes an action to deny them from being there. They are lost because they have solidified themselves into a character that is antithesis to God, and they, they, would, they would be tormented to be there. They don't want to be there. Other questions? Yes? So where does the, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess? So where does every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess? I, I kind of truncated the storyline. If you'd have read the whole storyline, that's in that same process as they march on the city and the fire come down and they see all the things that they've done, written as it were in letters of fire. At that point, they are overwhelmed by the reality. They can no longer deny their own condition and all knees fall down and acknowledge, yes, this is right. And they acknowledge it's right, but they still don't want to be there. They prefer. You go, I can't believe that would be true. Well, I had a patient. I describe it in my book, The God-Shaped Brain. I was consulted to see an alcoholic patient who was in liver failure in the ICU. 
And when I went to see him, um, I was uh, consulted to bring him over to the psych unit for detox and rehabilitation because he almost died from liver failure from heavy drinking. And he said he doesn't need a psychiatrist. He doesn't want a psychiatrist. And I said, well, what do you think almost happened here? He said, I almost died. Why did you almost die? From drinking. I said, what do you plan to do when you leave here? I'm going to go home and drink and get drunk. I said, do you want to die? No, I don't want to die. I said, do you understand if you drink, you might die? Yes. I said, well, if you, if you don't want to die, then you're going to drink. You're likely going to die. Why are you going to go home and drink? Because I would rather die than not drink. That's how it will be. Yes, he understood it. He understood. He, is, he just confessed with his mouth his circumstance and situation, yet he did not want to change. That's what it will be. They will confess it, but they have no desire to change. Others? Other questions? Did you like this perspective? Do you see how we have harmony with all the scriptures? And yet we have a God who's completely trustworthy. A God you don't need to be protected from. You understand the imperial view has you believing things like, I need someone to protect me from God. I need an intercessor to stand between me and God. I need to be shielded from God. Because God is the source of pain. God is the source of punishment. God is the source of suffering. It's all a lie. Who wants you to be shielded? We should be praying like David. Search me and see the wicked way in me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Yes, hand? Fall hand somewhere? Yes. Yes. That's, that's Thessalonians. Oh, let me turn that back on. It's way back there. There it is. Okay, so this is 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. Did you need me to explain that again, or did you just need to see it again? Did you want me to explain that again? Okay, and so what does this mean? We are tripartite. This means that when we die, our individualities, our personhood, our software is safe and secure with Christ in heaven. We are in a state of sleep. Just like your computer, when you shut your computer off and it's back up on the cloud, somebody might destroy the machine, but the, all the data, and that's what you want. And if you go buy a new machine and you download from the cloud all your data, what have you just done? You've resurrected your computer, haven't you? And you might even have resurrected it with an upgraded hardware, so it's much more efficient now. But it still has all the same unique characteristics. Okay? And so when we get new hardware, we don't get new character. We don't get new identities. We don't get new individuality. So our individuality is safe and secure with Christ in heaven. And um, our bodies are deteriorating into dirt. And that's what comes up out of the, notice the same passage, the dead in Christ rise first. New bodies are coming up, downloading into the new hardware, breath of life, they live again. Yes? I'm sorry, Cindy, I didn't hear you. Did Jesus have to die for us to be saved? Yes, so then we would not have remedy for our condition. If you will postpone that to the very next talk that I'm going to do, I go into detail what Jesus actually achieved at the crucifixion and why he had to go through that. And without that, there was no salvation. But in the simple answer, we have a terminal condition. His death destroyed the condition and provided remedy. Without his death, we might see how wonderful he is. We might be one to trust. Like you trust a doctor when you have leukemia. I trust my doctor, but he has no remedy for my leukemia. That's where we'd be left without his death. We trust him. We've been one to trust because he's beautiful and he's amazing, but we still don't have a, a, a remedy that fixes what's wrong with us. His death was the process to provide that remedy, and I will explain how and why in the next talk. Yes? Uh, is Moses, Elijah, are they exceptions to the sleep rule? No. Uh, what, uh, Moses did go into the sleep mode. And he was resurrected. And you talked about it in Jude. Michael came down or Jesus came down and resurrected him. So he did go into sleep mode. Elijah and Enoch never went into sleep mode. And they are more like those who are translated at the end in the same passage. And we, um, and we who are still alive or left or caught up together with them in the air, that's like, Moses, that's like Elijah and Enoch. Right there. 
exceptions, uh, what rule? Not everyone will. The, 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 um, the um, Enoch didn't, Elijah didn't, and the righteous at the end of time of the second coming won't. There will be many, at, at that time, there will be many, many more than those two that we know of that won't actually go into sleep mode. Yes. Wait, yes. So you mentioned how it's um, voluntary if we have decisions we can make whether or not we want to choose to be in the New Jerusalem or outside of the walls. But um, there's, you know, the law of love, the law of liberty. How do you integrate that with the fact that we're all addicts? Um, it's not like the story you just told, pretty extreme. Um, there's epigenetics, there's social factors, so there's all kinds of things that without us really knowing affect our decision to I, I, So, so uh, for, for she... I'm not really not understanding the question. I, I heard you describe some facts about our physiology being weak with epigenetics and different propensities. You, you took a position that some take that I'm not a, a, an actual agreement of, that we're all addicts. I don't think that's true. Um, uh, I think if you read in James chapter 1, it describes that we have um, three primary avenues for which we are tempted, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So some people have the addiction process, the lust of the flesh, sensualism, but others have materialism and egotism, and they really aren't tempted by the addictive processes. Um, even, I'm not just mean physical addiction, I mean like the sexual addiction, which is, uh, uh, and or the other shopaholic addictions and things. Uh, there are some people that really aren't tempted by the addictions. Their neurobiology is different, but they are tempted with ego and pride. So I, I don't go, I don't buy this thing, we're all addicts. Um, but we all are selfish. And we all are fear-ridden. And we all have drives to survive that interfere with our ability to love others well. And what the Bible teaches is that those who come to know God, trust him, and when they trust him, they get new desires in their hearts. The Holy Spirit takes the achievements of Christ and reproduces it in us, so it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. So we don't get new biology here and now. This mortal will put on incorruption at the second coming. That's when we get new biology, but we get new heart motives, new drives, new desires, so that the things we once loved become antithesis to us. We don't like them anymore. We are repulsed by those things. Even though we may be biologically still vulnerable, and I know people who had addictions, and there's two types of those in recovery. There's the dry alcoholic who doesn't drink, but they still crave it and want it. And then there's the, the al alcoholic who's actually had a character change where the idea of drinking and doing alcohol now is actually revolting to them. It's disgusting. They would hate it. Okay? They've had a heart change. The other hasn't. And so even though they remain biologically vulnerable to the substance, so we can talk about that more, but we are out of time, and I told him I'd stop right on time. So let's close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you are our creator God who built the universe to operate in harmony with your wonderful and beautiful character of love, with the principles of truth and freedom. We ask that your spirit of truth and love would be poured out upon us. Help our, our minds to be able to connect the dots that you have revealed to us through the various avenues of revelation that we can come to see you in your true light and, and, and be avenues of, of revealing that light to others so that the world can be lighted and we can go home with you forever. We pray in your holy name. Amen.